Okay, uh, my name is Jun Na. I'm a solutions consultant, uh, you know, from Oracle Construction and Engineering, and I um, mean, I'm really excited to have an opportunity to moderate this panel today. Um, not only as a resident of Houston, but also as someone who was directly impacted by Hurricane Harvey several years ago. Um, you know, stormwater management uh, has been a topic that um, unwillingly has become very important in my life, and I'm sure there are lot of people that are out there that shares a similar story. So um, in this session, uh, we'll be talking about some challenges um, in the state of Texas that we're facing around stormwater and flood mitigation uh, issues. And uh, we'll discuss and hear from our expert panel on uh, what we're doing to solve those challenges that we're facing. So I'd like to, well, Greg, if you want to reintroduce yourself. To <laughs> Still Greg Ireley with Houston Water. And, um, I'm Travis Atanasio. I work with the city of Burleson, which is the uh, a suburb of Fort Worth. Uh, but really, I'm here for the American Society of Civil Engineers. I'm the past president of the Texas section. So uh, when you're president, you get to do a lot of travel. Uh, you get to see the state um, all over. And you get to see and hear both the same problems and new, and, and new problems. Great. OK. So um, you know, I think it was actually a great um, segue and you know from our last discussions about climate change because you know when it comes to stormwater I think there's a lot of correlation between climate change and you know how the storm you know the impacts of stormwater so I guess our first question um, to the you know to both of you really is just you know can you guys talk about some impacts that climate change has had you know in terms of how you manage um, you know flood mitigation and think about stormwater management um, and some challenges that have come up because of climate change. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're a little early. Um, so, sorry, Brooke, we can kind of get started. No, I'm, I, I am so sorry. I came from another speech, so uh, <laughs> double book today. Anyways, happy to be here. Yep. Um, Brooke, you, did you want to have a chance to introduce yourself to the, to the audience? Uh, sure. I'm uh, Chairwoman Brooke Pop at the Texas Water Development Board. I'm happy to be here. In 2017, my little agency was tasked with something called the statewide flood assessment that translate into 2019, um, receiving almost $800 million for flood mitigation from the state of Texas um, to develop the flood infrastructure fund. Um, very, very, very successful and happy to talk about it today. All right, awesome. Um, so back to the question that we're having. So um, if, you, if you guys could just uh, talk a little bit about the impact of climate change has had um, in terms of stormwater management and flood mitigation. Sure, uh, I'll start off. So uh, recently the data that you was used for rainfall uh, was updated by uh, National Weather Service and NOAA, a collaborative uh, Atlas 14 data. Um, and the data that previously was used to design most of the storm infrastructure was data from the 60s. So it took a while to get that updated data. Uh, but basically what it shows is that uh, yesterday's 100-year flood is today's 50-year flood. And just keep going down in that. Uh, the, the, it's raining more. Um, as was mentioned in the last session, about 3,000 people moved to Texas per day. So that's about a Senate district a year. And uh, while no one's packing stormwater infrastructure in their in their U-Hauls, uh, that is more rooftops. That's more impervious surface, and that's uh, really what's what's happening. Uh, why the storms seemingly are so bad. I think just looking at uh, the frequency between storm and drought uh, has. So we're going to more extreme rainfall events with longer periods of no rain in between. And, and so how do you move water uh, so you don't flood, but at the same time uh, try to find ways to store water? Uh, water is easy to store, um, and it's difficult to move mechanically and very expensive. And, and so managing that balance, knowing that our reservoirs um, are not necessarily going to recharge in the way that they have in the past, 
and how we look at storm events here in Texas on a storm water, water management side is so much different than where I came, came from in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, a five-year uh, storm up there um, is just... It's just the afternoon of normal rainfall in Texas when you guys have rain. And, and so, you know, there, uh, if you have a 24-hour storm that's uh, over three inches of rainfall, that's a five-year event. Um, I mean, that's big news. And, uh, and so um, I think just the interplay between wanting to move water and protect properties and protect people away from flood. But at the same time, in Texas, that is your supply of water. Um, you don't have a lot of natural lakes. In fact, there's only one. Uh, Which lake is it? Uh, it's, I, I, I know it's on the Texas-Arkansas border. It's Caddo Lake. Yeah, yeah. Texarkana, wherever they call that. Uh, and then... Uh, and then there's no snow snowpack, so you know you don't have the luxury of you know a couple hundred inches of snow waiting for you to melt all through the summer. So um, yeah, so it's that balancing the the two uh, is, to me is going to be the challenge. Okay, thank you, Brooke. Any thoughts? Oh sure, I have thoughts all day. Yeah. Um, how much time do <laughs> we'll I have? Love to hear, we'll love to hear. Um, no, I, I, I loved your answer. Um, Texas is a state that grapples with extreme drought and extreme flood. Um, and we flip the switch. It, we can be in an extreme drought in the next, uh, like a 2017, uh, Harvey hits and we're flooded for months and months and months and months. Um, so my little agency, the Texas Water Development Board, is tasked with planning for both. Um, I tell you, in 2018, when I was appointed to the board, I didn't need readers. Um, I didn't have to go to the beauty salon for gray hairs every uh, three weeks now, Lindsay. Um, I was a lot more youthful. Uh, this job has aged me a lot because the planning for both of those events um, is so necessary um, because it's literally life or death. Uh, if you don't have water, your communities don't thrive. Your economies don't thrive. Um, we're planning for the Samsungs to come in, um, for the chip plants to come in, but there's, uh, there's nothing in the state water plan that we put out every five years that uh, speaks to where we're going to get that water. And that's the same with flood. Uh, 2017, again, we uh, put out the uh, first state flood assessment, get, delivered it to the legislature in 2019, realized that all of our maps were outdated, our data was terrible in the state of Texas, and set out to ensure that we had better flood maps because what good is a flood mitigation strategy um, if you don't know where it really floods? So we went out and uh, used something called LIDAR, and I'm the lawyer on the board, so this is not my strong suit, but according to my IT nerds, which I, I love and I affectionately call them this, um, it's laser beams that float down from a plane. Um, in the thousands of seconds. And we have full LIDAR coverage of the entire state, which mapped the topography, which helped us um, then figure out where it's truly flooding in the state of Texas. And since 2019, we've managed to commit over $500 million to 140, Lindsay, that sounds right, right? 140, yes, uh, flood mitigation strategies throughout the state of Texas, um, immensely proud of that. I will say when you talk about climate, um, the events are getting stronger. Um, droughts are getting longer. Uh, rain events are getting harder. Um, and we are trying to plan for both of those. Um, but we have to have the data and the science behind us. And my little agency is really working towards that. For storm nerds like me, um, I love having <laughs> base level engineering data for the entire state. Thank you. I'm, we're really, really proud of it. Um, it was a very, very big deal. Okay. Um, it's just really following up on that. Um, it sounds like we're, you know, you guys are investing in a lot and understanding what's going on, some impacts. Um, and just from what I hear from Greg, a lot of that, you know, when we think about the solutions, um, 
the upgrading infrastructure at, since we were at for day uh, seems to be a big part of that, you know, solutions into how we solve for this, you know, uh, climate change and population increase that we're facing. I'm just kind of curious, um, I know from previous uh, session, Greg, that you, you mentioned you, you didn't have enough funding, but just kind of would love to understand what are other challenges around, you know, um, you know, upgrading infrastructure to manage and, and, and brace for these mitigations for, you know, from climate change and other factors. Can you, can you guys talk about some current challenges that you guys are trying to solve um, in, in terms of how you think about upgrading the current infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in Houston, you know, the public perception is that, at least for a portion of the public, is the reason we built dams uh, and created these reservoirs is for flood protection. Uh, that is not the case. The, those dams were built to hold back water for drinking water. And people said, hey, there's a lake there. That's a nice place to build a house. Or, and, uh, and so a lot of these properties have been impacted repeatedly uh, by flooding, and there's a lot of pressure on us to do something. You know, I've been asked uh, just recently, as of last week, uh, by a resident, why don't I dump eight to 10 feet of water, discharge eight to 10 feet of water out of Houston, Lake Houston prior to our storm event because his house flooded. If I have a glass of water here and I have a gallon of water here, and if I dump out half of that glass of water, that's Lake Houston. So storms come in, I'm gonna dump out half, half of our drinking water. And if the storm hits, I pour a gallon of water into that half full glass. The fact that I dumped half that water out isn't gonna make any difference. And that's how our reservoirs in, in general in, in Texas operate. If the storm doesn't come, which I'm baffled c compared to the Pacific Northwest when it, when it rains in Oregon and it's raining in Washington. In, in Texas, you can get 10 inches here and nothing over here, and it's crazy. And so if the storm doesn't come, I've just dumped out half of our drinking water, and I, and I still have half of our drinking water. So this idea that we're going to retrofit our dams to mitigate flooding, uh, it will it make a difference? Maybe. Uh, I don't know that we've really demonstrated that yet. So that's a real challenge is public education that our dams and reservoirs, uh, their primary purpose is not flood mitigation. It is to store water for, for, for use. Well, and it's also not to just provide a beautiful recreational lake for a, a beautiful house. Um, and that, that is a hard sell at times. You have the hardest job ever. So, uh, yes, to go on to... Uh, to come on to your message there. Um, a lot of the, the funding problems that, that I see across the state is that once the infrastructure is built, uh, everybody expects it to perform the same way over its lifetime. Uh, so there's, there's about 7,000 dams, or well, 7,000 dams that make 7,000 lakes in Texas. Uh, as I was mentioned, there's one natural lake. It has a dam, so techni technically, but it's, uh, it's in, the dam's in Louisiana, so. <laughs> Um, so when we do have... So you're saying all of our lakes are dammed. All of the lakes are dammed. <laughs> yes. You know, we uh, thought about having a statewide awareness campaign a few years ago where we would uh, call it Damn It, Texas. Uh, didn't go very far. Uh, but. So with those 7,000 dams, uh, there's seven dam inspectors in the state. So imagine uh, a scenario where just in the dfw area if if ray roberts were to somehow breach uh, lake lewisville that dam would breach uh, livingston the flood wave would just travel straight down downtown dallas would have about 24 feet of water um, it travels down to livingston livingston can't take that capacity um, then it just goes into trinity bay so that's 96 billion gallons of water that was drinking water or recreation water or anything like that. Uh, so making sure that the dams are taken care of. Um, one, one other dam that I, that I like to, I'm actually near this dam and I enjoy this lake, Eagle Mountain Lake up in Fort Worth. It's the uh, largest hydrostatic dam in the US still standing. 
uh, which means the water has to be behind the dam to make it, to make it work. Uh, well, back when the uh, Barnett Shale was producing a lot of gas, all of a sudden Tarrant County was dealing with a brand new problem named earthquakes. So they had to retrofit that dam with some gauges because if an earthquake hits near a dam, bad news, especially if it's a hydrostatic one. Hmm. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I would say from the Water Development Board's perspective, with flood, again, you know, our flood program is, is new, relatively new. You know, we were um, established in the 1950s after the drought of record, and our primary responsibility since the 50s was water supply. Um, that changed in 2019 when we um, were kindly told and given, uh, the, I always say the legislature loves us to death, um, that now you're in charge of flood mitigation for the state of Texas, um, which is a completely different animal than water supply. Water supply brings revenue back. Flood mitigation is, is thankless. It does not love you back at times. Um, it's something that I've learned with the, the dam issue is, um, not the dam at Texas, which I still think is pretty <laughs> hilarious. Um, it's a who's on first with, with the dams? Who's actually taking care of them? Who's responsible for um, going in and doing the, the true maintenance? Who, who's gonna be there? if something fails. And there's a lot of different answers right now. But I do know that uh, TWDB has um, at least three commitments to dams in Central Texas to, uh, to, to better fit them right now in the, the tune of about $100 million. Um, I will say at the board, the thing that I'm seeing that is the biggest issue, just in general, um, is workforce for us. Um, finding people that are willing to come work for the state, that are knowledgeable, that are engineers, that know flood, that know water supply, um, and are willing to put in the work. Um, it's expensive in Austin. It's expensive to live. Um, we need the best of the best, and we can't pay for the best of the best. So we have to rely on our wonderful mission, which is helping us secure a water future for the state of Texas. Um, but if we don't have that workforce, none of our programs matter. So that is the biggest issue I am seeing moving forward. We've got the science, we've got the data, but I need the people in the offices to help us with that. Thank you. Um, I think some of these were already answered, but um, you know, just moving on to the, the solutioning part, um, I'd be kind of, I'd be very curious to hear, you know, what you guys are excited about, you know, in terms of some current initiatives that you guys are working on to address some of these challenges. I understand not all of them might be getting addressed right away, um, or you know, if if not, uh, or, and we'll also love to hear about some you know, initiatives that you guys would like to take on but couldn't, or you know, just like to see whether that's you know, policy changes or you know, more increased funding, whatever that may be, just be kind of curious, um, kind of related to our last panel's you know, magic wand question. Just would love to hear your ideal state or some initiatives that you'd like to take on. Oh, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> give me a microphone. I, and I, we only have 11 minutes left. Like I'll. I'm not going to take all of that, but I could. Um, this last board meeting, we approved um, the 15 regional flood plans, uh, amended flood plans for the state of Texas, um, to the tune of $52 billion in flood mitigation projects. Um, that's how much it will cost in the statewide flood plan, which will be delivered to the legislature in less than seven months. Um, extremely excited about that. It's the first ever statewide flood plan that the state of Texas has ever had. Um, but I cannot overemphasize that price tag enough. $52 billion to properly mitigate flood in the state of Texas. Um, what floods, what flood mitigation needs are in El Paso are very different than what they are in the valley. Um, and what they are in Dallas, and what they are in Houston, in your neck of the woods. Like, everything is very, very different, but all of them share the same requirement, and they require a lot of dollars and people. Um, 
that's a really big deal. But the fact that we now have a price tag and now have the data and the science behind a statewide flood plan is extraordinary. And I'm excited to see what we do. Um, I've said this many a time, and I'm sure Betty is so tired of me saying this, but uh, flood is very, very personal to me. Um, my dear friend lost her two nieces and her sister to the Wimberley Day floods. And my best friend barely escaped with her life at the Onion Day floods, Onion Creek floods, um, with my godson on her shoulders. Um, because all the flood gauges and the early warning failed them in every way, shape, and form. So the first thing we funded at the board um, that I chair was those early warning and a, a immediate uh, infrastructure that would save lives and property. Um, not on my watch while I lose another person um, because a flood gauge or an early warning system fails. I will not let that happen. So very, very proud of that. And with that, I will, I will shut my mouth. So the Texas section of ASCE, uh, every four years, releases an infrastructure report card. Um, the, the stormwater flooding categories always scored a D uh, every time that we've uh, looked at it. Uh, this is a group of like 60 engineers that get together and grade various categories. Uh, we expect that grade to go up with the statewide flood plan this year. Uh, well, we're, we're not D students and C students <laughs> in the state of Texas. So as much as I love you, I do not like that uh, that grade. Right. So. And nobody does. You don't, don't want to go home with a, a C report card ever, no. uh, C or D. So uh, interesting thing is when we released our report card in 2017, uh, we were about to release it when Hurricane Harvey came uh, ashore. And while we had the data from 2015 and 2016 in Houston, we were not quite prepared for Hurricane Harvey, so we had to wait on our flood chapter to make sure that what we were about to put out there truly was what happened on the ground. Uh, for reference, the 2015, 16, and 17 floods in Houston were 500-year events, so that's three years of back-to-back 500-year -back events. Uh, now in 2021, uh, another interesting one, not related to stormwater, but the uh, we were released, about to release our port report card. Actually, we did release our report card with a grade of B plus for energy. And the next week, the power grid failed. So we were releasing in 2025. So just prepare for something to go wrong <laughs> <laughs> next year. Uh, for us, it's uh, definitely one water. Uh, you know, we got a grant from the development board and uh, that is kind of our vehicle and really, frankly, our excuse to reach out to all of the other communities around us and all the other stakeholders to approach water. Um, so that's stormwater flood mitigation, that's drinking water, it's wastewater and reuse to approach all of that in a holistic manner and bring everybody together. And last session, I talked about the jelly donut, the political power of the jelly donut. Uh, that's going to bring that jelly donut together. And I think we can do something amazing in Houston uh, with water, uh, all things related to water, uh, if, if we really embrace one water and bring everybody together at the table and say, how is it are we going to come together in our, you know, there's, there's close to 6 million, they say, down in the Houston area, but I know we serve about 4 million people for drinking water. Uh, it, to bring everybody together uh, on this journey and is how we how do we balance all of this and come together and you know treat water the way it needs to be treated if we treated water our our our, our water bill with the same respect as our cell phone bill um, we would be a lot better off we obviously don't understand the value of water we spend hundreds of thousand dollars per acre foot of water to buy bottled water, and we and then we turn around and complain about rates for for water. Um, so we obviously do not understand the value of water. We can't live, uh, you know, three four days uh, and. Uh, without water, and some days are here in Texas. I don't even think you can live a day, but anyway. We do not understand that, and the power of water. It can generate power. It can do so many things. Not so much in Houston. We don't, it's pretty flat. But 
I think one water is what we're super excited about and we can bring that jelly donut together and look for it. And, and, and I think in a couple of years, you'll see a shift in Houston's approach to how it values water. Uh, and we won't have 1,800 active leaks in the city. Uh, I won't be there, certainly, if we do. So, oh, and one final thing, uh, Houston's water was voted best tasting water in Texas last year by. Oh well, oh, snaps to you. <laughs> um, I have to jump in because I love what you just said. Uh, we need a shift in the way we think about water in the state of Texas. Um, I would humbly, well, not so humbly, but I would submit that water is the number one issue facing the state. It does not matter if we have roads. It does not matter if we have schools. It does not matter if we have chip plants coming in. If we don't have the water to support all of these needs and the 1,300 citizens a day that are moving to the state of Texas, none of it matters. So trying to get the public and leadership to focus on this one singular issue and to put some real money behind it has been um, my biggest challenge as chairwoman. Uh, this last session, we, thank goodness, Prop 6 passed. I, I was told it's illegal for me to tell y'all to go vote for it, so I didn't. But I'm very grateful if you did vote for Prop 6 that gave a billion dollars to water infrastructure for the state of Texas. Um, but our state water plan has a capital cost of $80 billion. That's 2022 state water plan. Our capital costs are $80 billion, and those are based off of 2018 estimates. So probably closer to 110 billion. So that $1 billion, and God bless you if you voted for it, thank God, um, it's not gonna go that far when you look at the needs of the state with the growth. Um, so just changing everyone's mentality about the value of water, we talk about it at the board ad nauseum. What's the value of water to everyone? What's the value of infrastructure to the state of Texas? Um, if we don't have it, we don't thrive. If we say at the board, there's no Texas miracle, this great American dream that we're providing for all these transplants um, without Texas water. And that is very, very true. But if you don't invest in your infrastructure, you will not thrive. I gave a speech yesterday at TWCA. I'm a huge history nerd. It's a problem. Um, there wasn't much I could tell this group. Um, the, the biggest and best history or water nerds in the state of Texas, they know everything. So I went back to ancient times and talked about ancient water infrastructure. Egypt, Persia, um, it's a really, really cool speech. So if you care, like, it's happy to give it to anyone. Um, but it talked about the Roman times when, um, when they were finally sacked in 527 and all the aqueducts broke and the Roman Empire uh, died and all of that infrastructure knowledge, because they had their own version of TCAQ. They tested water quality. They provided water to their entire empire um, because they knew it was a life or death challenge for them. All of that went away and the world went into turmoil. No one had clean water. Plagues were everywhere. Cholera was everywhere. And if we're not careful and we don't invest in our infrastructure, things like that can happen. Um, so this next session, I'm going to be asking the Texas legislature for a dedicated revenue source for water for the state of Texas. I don't know what that looks like and devil's in the details and Lindsay's gonna get a hook and pull me off the stage real quick. Um, but it's time, we invest in roads. Um, it's time to invest in water permanently. Um, because our kids deserve it. Okay, I think that's actually a great place to you know, conclude our panel. Um, I wanted to thank each one of our panelists here uh, with you know, very passionate about the topic. I'm very hopeful that you guys will solve it as a resident of Texas. Texas and uh, thank you very much for your time today. Mm -hmm. and, uh, today. <laughs>